Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the Lead X Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. What are the five secrets to unleashing the genius in others? Hello, everyone. Kevin Cruz here, helping you to achieve your full potential five days a week. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about how the best leaders make everyone smarter. But first, don't forget to visit leadx.org. You'll find hundreds of articles from dozens of the best business and career writers out there. And sign up for our quick read newsletter, which is packed with actionable tips you can try out right away. That's leadx.org. Our guest today worked for 17 years at Oracle as the vice president of Oracle University and as the global leader for human resource development. Today, she teaches leadership to executives and emerging leaders around the world, including clients at Apple, Disney, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. She's been listed by the prestigious Thinkers 50 as one of the top 10 leadership thinkers in the world. Her best-selling book is Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. Our guest, of course, is Liz Weissman. Liz, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. I'm, I'm delighted to talk with you. Oh, I'm excited. And we're going to talk about multipliers in just a minute. But first, will you share with our listeners a time when you failed, maybe early in your career? And what was your lesson? What did you learn from it? Well, you know, if we go back, if we go back to the really early days of my career, you mentioned that I started my career at Oracle. And so I, I came out of business school. I joined a software company and it was all about the technology. And I had an epic fail in my first couple of weeks. We went through this new hire boot camp program. And our main job in this boot camp program was to learn how to, how to code. And I mean, I had taken a Fortran programming class in college, but it was my lowest grade I ever got. So <laughs> this was kind of a, it was, but somehow they hired me anyway, and I get thrown into this coding camp, and it culminates in a couple big projects, and one of them was every one of the students, all these new hires, all coming out of school, most of them, you know, with advanced degrees in computer science, and then there's me with my business degree, we had to build a uh, an application. But this wasn't an app that, of course, ran on a, a phone. It was an application for some um, business. So we have to build this with Oracle software. We build it. We demo it. It's kind of our graduation project. It's sort of high stakes. We've got these um, judges that are managers out in, in the company. And when it's time for me to do my demo, I get up there, I've built this demo, I've practiced my script, I get up to deliver it, and I pull up my, my application. So I log in, pull up my file, I start to demo this piece of software, and it's not looking like it's supposed to look. And it's not looking <laughs> like anything that I have built. It's not looking like anything familiar. And I'm just watching like the air in the room get sucked <laughs> out. And everyone's looking at me because they realize I don't even know what's going on. And what had happened is this wasn't my application that I built. Now, I don't know what's gone wrong. I just know something's gone wrong. The judge, this this technical hiring manager, he knows what's gone wrong. See, we were operating on a mini computer on uh, with a Unix operating system. And I had pulled up an application, but I was actually in somebody else's account. He could tell <laughs> that I wasn't even in my own directory structure. I was in Dave Rubel's directory <laughs> structure, the guy who went before me. So I'm not only pulling up his piece of code and software that he's demoing, it's like some early version, some cruddy version that doesn't work. And here's what I learned from this experience because uh, Bob McCormick was his name and Bob looks at me and this was supposed to be this like boot camp kind of ruthless experience. And I knew that I had really screwed up big time <laughs> and I was waiting for him to just like fillet me. And I, I was, I was ready to go down and Bob McCormick, he looked at me and he said, Liz, I think you're actually in um, Dave's, account and you're probably pulling up somebody else's work. He said, why don't you log out, go into your directory structure, pull up yours, and why don't you start again? Mm. 
And it was this, it was this act of compassion that I was not prepared for. I was really prepared to go down in flames and he could have, and maybe he should have done that, <laughs> but it, it set the tone for me. And, um, you know, I got thrown into management really, really early in my career. And what it taught me is that, you know, managers out there want people to be successful. And when you are in this moment, when someone's made a mistake, you, you have a decision. Do you kind of watch them go down in flames and sort of make a spectacle of it? Or do you help them recover from it? It actually, strangely, this little experience really affected how I think about the role of a manager. And I have not stopped loving this Bob McCormick guy. Anytime I ever see him, it's like, you know what? Thank you. All these years later, you still think of this Bob McCormick story. And years later, I mean, Bob has been, you know, an informal mentor into your own leadership and work. I mean, that just really uh, says a lot about Bob and this, this moment of compassion. Yeah, and I do think it is, um, it's one of the, the critical roles of a leader is to help someone recover from mistakes. How do you get back up on the horse, so to speak? And how do you, how do you learn from it? But how do you recover with dignity so that you stay in the game? Yeah, recover with dignity. I like that phrase. So Liz, your book is multipliers, how the best leaders make everyone smarter. And, you know, based on your research and experience, you say there are basically Two kinds of leaders. Uh, what what kind are they? Well, you know, this actually came from an observation I had at Oracle. I got thrown into this company of, you know, really, really smart people. There were all these geniuses around me. And as I watched all these brilliant people, I noticed that people used their intelligence in different ways, that there were leaders who were really, really smart, but other people weren't smart around them. Like, so if you've, if you've ever seen intelligence used as a weapon, you know what this is like. Yeah. Like, if you've ever seen a really, a really smart person suck the intelligence out of a room, you've seen one of these leaders that I call diminishers. They tend to be really smart, but, but people aren't smart around them. You know, when they walk in a room, people get quiet, they hold back, they play it safe, or, you know, or these leaders become like wet blankets. On, on ideas and energy and, and innovation. And I saw these leaders and I wondered, why is it that they're smart, but other people aren't smart around them? And then I saw a very different kind of leader who was equally intelligent, but their intelligence was um, infectious, is how I first noticed it. I'm like, wow, because other people seem to be really smart and at their best around them. Um, when these leaders walk into a room, you can see a, a visibly different reaction. People tend to kind of sit up, they lean forward, ideas flow, and problems get solved. It's like you can imagine light bulbs going off over people's heads when they're in the room. And I came to call those leaders multipliers. And when I, when I double clicked on this idea or this observation that I had and really studied it and looked at the impact that they had on others, I found a very profound difference in the capability. These diminishers tend to get less than half of people's intelligence or capability, whereas these multipliers, you know, get, get all of it. And I thought, wow, we, you know, we've got a lot of really smart people showing up at work, you know, badging into the office every morning, but a lot of that intelligence is going underutilized. And I think it was actually that that put me on. Um, it's a little bit of a self-declared mission to to rid the world of bad bosses. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And um, we were talking a little bit uh, before the official interview. I mean, the, the the research on employee engagement is is clear. I mean, the, depending on who's running the survey, the numbers bounce around a little bit. But about two thirds of the people out there are not engaged uh, at work, you know, less than a third are engaged. And as you talk about, you know, the, the smart people who sort of shut down people around them. I mean, I literally am remembering partners and executives, <laughs> like it's, I can see their faces and I know their names. And especially early in my career, I mean, two of the smartest, highest IQ people I know, and I consider them friends. One, I mean, if the, everyone that had a good idea, it was almost, um, 
like sport for him to spar. And I don't think he re even realized, you know, what he was doing. He wasn't trying to shut everyone else down, but he was. And then the other one, smartest guy in the room, but no matter what you said, he would always say, tell me more is, you know, one, one of his techniques to draw people out. And it's that IQ both sky high. And yet one had very poor performing teams and people who couldn't wait to get off of his teams. And the other was a, a real talent magnet. So I like that diminishers and multipliers. And it's interesting, your observation, Kevin, and, and I would encourage anyone who's listening to think about maybe someone who was a diminisher uh, to you or to others and, and someone who's a multiplier. But your observation carries with that, I think, a really important insight is this person was a friend. And, you know, when I started this research, I thought these diminishers were these like narcissistic, tyrannical bully types who, who really kind of shut people down for sport because I saw a few of them. Yeah. But when I really began to study it and look at what is causing this disengagement um, and this diminishing across our workplaces, what I found is that most of these diminishers were actually pretty decent people, nice people, someone you might call a friend. But yet they were having a diminishing impact. And so, you know, I, I maybe started on, like I said, a self-proclaimed mission to rid the world of, uh, of bad bosses. Um, I haven't been entirely successful at that in case, <laughs> in case we as, haven't noticed. As, as many of our listeners will, will agree with, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a mission that I'm, I'm kind of failing at. But I have stopped worrying about the kind of capital D or all caps diminish your kind of bad boss. And I spend a lot more of my time thinking about how well-intended managers, people who really value the people they work with, people who, who see talent in others, people who enjoy leading and managing, how those of us with the best of intentions can end up shutting down the very people that we're trying to engage and, and utilize and Liz, I'm so glad you set this up because uh, for all the listeners out there who are managers, I, I, you know, you should not be hearing like, well, I'm not I'm not one of those jerk bosses. I don't need to worry about this. What, when I read multipliers, there are times it's like, ooh, uh, this is uh, here's a couple ways I was diminishing being a diminisher and didn't even realize it. So just Liz, as you've said, anyone who has potential, these are learnable things that you can do in the workplace. And you say, you know, multipliers practice five disciplines. And, you know, we can't, we don't have time to go deep into all of them, but can you walk us through, you know, briefly what the five are? Yeah. The, the five things I found that diminishers and multipliers do very, very differently. And the first is how they manage talent. Uh, the diminisher tends to acquire resources. I call them empire builders and, and multipliers, they use people's native genius. They, they don't use people. They deeply utilize the genius of others. Um, the second is about the work environment. They create diminishers tend to be um, stress creators. They're tyrants. Um, multipliers create safety, not stress. They tend to have a liberating effect on others. The third difference or discipline is around how they set direction. And diminishers give directives. They set direction based on what they know and what they see. Whereas multipliers invite people to stretch, they define opportunities, they play the role of challenger, dragging people into new, interesting, uncomfortable space. The fourth is the way they make decisions. Um, the diminisher tends to be the decision maker. They make fast inner circle decisions that they then have to convince people to buy into. Mm -hmm. And, and the multiplier tends to be a debate maker. They invite people to weigh in and debate, which generates real and sustainable buy-in. And the last major difference I noticed is how they, they drive for results. And, you know, the diminisher tends to be the micromanagers. They jump in and out. They're like bungee boss. And where the multiplier, they're an investor. They give other people ownership and all the accountability that comes with it. And we found that these multiplier leaders, they're not just engaging, empowering, trusting, supportive kind of leaders, <laughs> like that Bob McCall moment that I had early on when he's like, okay, Liz, I'm, I'm going to help you recover. 
they're actually leaders with a hard edge. They, they challenge, they hold people accountable, they have high expectations. And it's why people give so much to these leaders. Um, it's because they demand so much from the people around them. Yeah. And this last point, Liz, I mean, I think that's a common misconception is uh, whenever leadership gurus start talking about employee engagement or modern day leadership, I think a lot of people think, oh, you're talking about you know, being a nice boss or a soft boss or something. And it really isn't the case. Doug Conant, former CEO of Campbell Soup, you know, he has a great phrase about, you know, be be tough on standards, but tender hearted on the people. And, you know, people want to work in an environment that is demanding the best of them and everyone around them. So I'm glad you ended on that point, just to make sure everyone realizes this isn't just about always <laughs> turning over, being soft on an issue. You know, it's funny as I, I mean, I've heard thousands and thousands of people tell me their stories about these multiplier leaders. And what I notice is there's almost just a little bit of a fear in them. It's like I would I wouldn't I would do anything to not disappoint this person. They fear disappointing, but they didn't fear the person. Right. Yeah, there's a big difference. Yeah, I remember I once had was um, coaching an executive and I was rounding up feedback around him and I was so struck by something virtually everyone on his management team said. They said, you know, I wish that he held me accountable mm. more often and to higher standards. Like we actually want, we want to be given, you know, it's funny, Gavin, you know, you and I both study leadership. I teach leadership all around the world, but you know, when you, when you, study leadership, what you end up learning a lot about is followership. Right, <laughs> That's what right. I feel like I've, you know, if I've developed any expertise, it's I've learned how people feel when they walk into an office. And what I have learned is that people all around the world, across industries, they come into the office every day, desperately wanting to give a hundred percent of their capability, wanting to be asked to do hard things, wanting to be held accountable to those. And the reason why I think we want to be held accountable is we also want the spotlight. We want, you right. know, like, hey, if I do good work, I want you to tell me I've done good work. And you know what? If I do anything less than good work, I'm willing to hear that because I want to do great work. Yeah. And this this was one of my biggest weaknesses as a a, a boss when I was in my 20s and I was young and dumb. I would withhold feedback and and you know, it was now I realize, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm an introvert. I was raised in a very non-confrontational household. I wanted everybody to like me, you know, it was one of those kinds of things. And so I would withhold feedback thinking like, oh, I don't, I don't want to bum them out. I don't want to stress them out. It wasn't that big of a deal. I don't want to disengage them. And it was only later. I mean, I was so slow to learn this. And again, I think it was some research that showed that yeah, people are super engaged if you, you know, compliment them and stress all of their strengths, but they're also engaged, almost equally engaged when you give them critical feedback. They get disengaged when you're silent, when you give them no feedback. All that time I'm thinking I'm doing everybody else a favor by withholding my feedback, you know, let me just store it up till that annual review eight months from now. I'll dump it on them then, right? It, it, I was right. doing it for myself. I just didn't have the professional courage to have a, a coaching conversation. I just didn't know better. Because when we do that, we are starving people of the vital information they need to perform. It's like um, if you're a thermostat and you've got to tell the, you know, like, you've got to say, oh, uh, the room is too cold. I need to tell the device to heat up, but I don't really want to tell it it's cold. You know, it, it's a ridiculous way we look at it. And and I think um, the multiplier way of seeing feedback is it's information that people need to be able to calibrate their performance. That was too hot that we need it colder. The room is too cold. We need it hot. And, and when I've reframed it to, I am not giving feedback. I am sharing information for people to recalibrate what they're doing. I find it a lot easier to do it because I'm better at sharing information than making judgments about people. Because I think a lot of us don't like to make those judgments. Like, who am I to really say? That is a huge truth bomb, and I wish I had it 20 years ago. I mean, right, we're just sharing information so they can calibrate uh, performance. It's, it's, that's a great way to, to put it, and it's very true. 
Yeah. Think of it as manager as thermostat. That's awesome. So Liz, let's say you've talked about these five sort of differences between the the diminishers and the multipliers, but you know, how do we, um, if, if we know we have some of these diminishing tendencies, we want to become a true multiplier. Like how do we get started? How do we accelerate our own growth as a leader, as a manager in these areas? I think the big growth comes when we understand how our very best intentions can go awry, how Mm -hmm. noble intentions don't always inspire noble action in our followers. So I would say figure out the way that you accidentally diminish. Uh, You know, I'll, I'll, I'll spout off a few ways that I tend to accidentally diminish. I'm a bit of an idea guy. I love the world of ideas. I love creative you know, innovative environment. So I'm always tossing out ideas and you can imagine what it does to the people around me as they're chasing these ideas, eventually <laughs> d- developing a case of apathy because we don't go anywhere with these ideas. Liz is just in love with ideas. And I've learned, you know, when I'm about to spout an idea, when my idea guy comes out, I, I ask myself a simple question, Liz, do you want your team to stop what they're doing right now and work on this? And the answer is almost always no. Um, so I've learned to temper this or, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've got an overabundance of optimism and, you know, some ways that makes, you know, for a very useful senior management trait. But, you know, an optimist can be extremely annoying <laughs> to the people around them. One, because they look like they've lost their tether to reality <laughs> and they're kind of lost in space. But what optimists often overlook is is the struggle. Right. The challenge, the part of work that is messy where we're learning and we're grappling and we logged into the wrong Unix account and we've made <laughs> mistakes because an optimist is like, hey, how hard can it be? It's all going to be great. And I've learned that that actually is, is diminishing and I've learned to spend more time signaling the struggle. Like, wow, what we're doing is hard. You know what? We're probably going to make some mistakes here. What you pointed out with these personal examples is – you know, sometimes we are the accidental diminisher. It, it's the flip side of one of our strengths or a couple of our strengths. It's too much the other way, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, you know, uh, someone who leads by example can very easily become the pace setter who mm. creates more spectators than followers. The the perfectionist, you know, has high standards of excellence, but other people see their work being critiqued. Um, if you want to figure out a few of the ways that you might accidentally diminish, we have this, this quiz. And I'm really sort of embarrassed and proud of this quiz. When I first um, did this research and wrote the book Multivars, I had, I had created this rigorous 360 assessment to test the presence of multiplier behavior and diminisher behavior. And my publisher said, she said, why don't you create like a little quiz, like a Cosmo quiz? Right, and I right. Thought, I said, I will have nothing to do with a Cosmo <laughs> quiz. Like, no, never, end of conversation. Well, you know what? I sat down and wrote this little quiz. This little quiz has been so helpful to so many people. It's a 10 question quiz. And there are 10 different ways that we can accidentally diminish. It takes like three minutes to take it. And, And I had to kind of swallow my pride on this because this little quiz has been so helpful to so, so many of, you know, by hundreds of thousands of people. So there's a little quiz out there. It's on multipliersbooks.com. It's fast, but it'll help you see how maybe your best intentions could actually be shutting down people rather than engaging and emboldening uh, the people around you. That's great. And Liz, say that, say that URL one more time, just to make sure everybody got it. Multipliers books.com. Perfect. And of course, we'll put that in the show notes as well. So I I think everybody, once we're done with this interview, who's listened, they're going to go out to multipliersbooks.com for the quiz. <laughs> your your version of the Cosmo quiz. Oh, Sounds I fun. Have said, I probably should not have used the term <laughs> Cosmo quiz because I think everyone's going to be woefully um, underimpressed with the quiz now. <laughs> it has no Cosmo qualities to it. But but give us one more challenge because I always tell our listeners, like, I want you to get 1% better every day. So give give them something else really practical that they could try today. Well, I'm going to I'm going to share two. One is just a reflection and and one is something you can do. I I think the important reflection is not only understanding how we can diminish accidentally, but understanding the situations that bring out our inner diminisher. You know, what we find is that there's a lot of people who who are like, "Wow, I'm a multiplier most of the time, but then, boy, 
there's certain situations. Understand what what situations bring out your micromanager, your tyrant. Um, for me, it's probably stress, tight deadlines. Um, understand what those situations are and have a game plan for what's going to happen when you get into a crisis and how do you get through that and get back to more of a multiplier stance. So that's one thing you can do. And here's here's a very, very simple but hard did you see me signaling how hard it is? Um, <laughs> a simple but hard thing that I think just kind of propels people into multiplier mode, and that is moving out of the mode of telling and operating in the mode of asking. It's learning to embrace the question as the key tool in, in our management toolbox. Um, you know, I think the best leaders tell less and and they ask more uh, they ask more questions they ask better questions they ask more from the people around them and and it's why they get more it's because they they ask and um, I've seen but I've seen um, managers sort of grow into this mode over their career kind of through that slow gentle real learning but I would encourage you, if you're listening right now, to take what I call the extreme question experience, which is a radical shift. And, and the extreme question challenge is, could you lead a meeting, a conversation, um, troubleshoot an issue, and all you do is ask, meaning you don't say anything like, oh, I agree, that's a good idea. All you do is just ask question after question after question. Um, you know, I stumbled into this when I was having trouble with the bedtime routine at home and I'm like in the bossy mom mode, kids, kids, go to bed, put that away, quit playing, leave her alone, get your pajamas on, go brush your teeth, go, you know, get, go to bed, back to bed, you know, no, no more stories, books done, say your prayers, and, you know, and I'm in this tell, 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 tell mode and it's not working very well. And, and it was actually a colleague of mine years ago, so probably 14, 15 years ago, who gave me this challenge as this mom of a six, four and two year old, he's like, well, why don't you try just asking your kids questions? And, and Kevin, it, it changed, you know, this little exercise changed me forever Wow. as a parent and as a leader, because suddenly I can't tell them what to do. I've just got to ask the questions that help them figure out what has to get done. And, you know, it shifted from utter chaos actually this sort of challenge and you know some people will will take this challenge literally trying to get their kids to bed and I've had people say wow it's like changed our our family dynamics but I'd encourage you to take this challenge at work maybe lead a staff meeting a touch base meeting with someone and all you do is ask it's hard but done once or twice I find it shifts the way we think about our role and it shifts do we do we pull towards telling or is our pull toward asking like tell me more right maybe to your point that boss that you observed kevin is maybe that's the simplest shift is to shift from telling to just saying tell me more and i find that it's probably the most profound shift that a leader can make to not just use the intelligence in their own head but the true intelligence and capability of their team so i'd give you that challenge I love it. A great challenge and a great reminder. Uh, I often tell people that the, the best of what we know about leading wholeheartedly at work also applies to every other area of our life as well. And you, you brought that home with the example with your own children. So Liz, you mentioned already the uh, URL for the quiz. How else might our listeners uh, find out more about you and your company? Well, our company is named very uncreatively, <laughs> thewisemangroup.com, or I'm out there on Twitter, at Liz Wiseman. And also, uh, I've got a new edition of the Multipliers book coming out in May, and I'm actually really excited about this because there's two and a half new chapters. The half chapter is just kind of making better a chapter that already existed, but there's a whole chapter on our accidental diminisher tendencies, and I'm excited about that, but I'm really, really excited about a new chapter and it addresses the number one issue I've heard from people over and over and over. And it's not, gee, Liz, how do I be more of a multiplier? I have heard from thousands of people who have just said, how do I deal with the diminishers mm, in my life right. at work? And so I actually really dug in and did a lot of research on this uh, and have a chapter on dealing with diminishers and 
uh, what I will say is that the strategies that people are employing today to deal with jerk bosses or even accidental diminishers aren't working. And the, the most used strategies are actually what I found the least effective. And what you'll find in that chapter is, uh, I think there's 13 strategies that actually really do work and change a diminishing dynamic um, into one that's more multiplying. Uh, because diminishing, I find it's prevalent everywhere, but it's not inevitable. There's actually a lot that we can do to come into work saying, you know what, I actually want to give 100%. And I, despite maybe even having a bad boss, I'm going to work in a way that I can continue to give all of my intelligence and capability and end up loving my job. That is uh, powerful stuff. I look forward to the new material in your, uh, in your next edition uh, as well. Thank you, Liz, very much for your time today. Any final words for our audience before we um, let them go start their day of questions? <laughs> uh, you know, okay, final word. I guess I would ask it. The question I ask myself is like, what is more powerful right now to play the role of the genius or to play the role of the genius maker? And that would be my, my thought and my challenge is that we come to see that really at the top of the intelligence hierarchy isn't really the genius. It's the, the genius maker who sees and uses genius in others. It's, it's far more scalable, and I, I dare say it's far more fun to, to live and work that way. Brilliant. All right, friends, you've just been mentored by a top 10 leadership thinker. Don't forget, you can get all of the links and notes from this interview over at leadx.org. You can get Liz's new uh, edition of Multipliers from Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. And one more thing, friends, if you've gotten even one new idea from the LeadX show, I hope you'll hop on over to iTunes, subscribe to the show, and just leave a short, honest review. Until next time, remember, of course, leadership isn't about a title or power or authority. It's about influence. You influence those around you with your words, but also with your silence. So leadership is not even a choice. You're a leader whether you want to be or not. The question is, what kind of leader will you be?